The question today is what is the relationship between plate tectonics and climate? And I'm going to show you that it's a lot simpler than you imagine. The link is volcanism, but climate is changing much faster than most people ever imagined. Now my key points are that climate change is controlled primarily by sub-aerial volcanism, that frequent major explosive eruptions cause incremental global cooling, that flood basaltic eruptions, on the other hand, cause sudden global warming, that sudden major warming followed by slow cooling occurs as often as every thousand years or a few thousand years in erratic sequences that are clearly not cyclic, they're erratic. This rate is very surprising. Plate tectonics determines which type of volcanism is dominant at any time, and these distinctive sequences of volcanism appear to provide another tool, much like magnetic anomalies, for interpreting the geologic record, including cross-correlation and dating. Now, aerosol-forming explosive eruptions, like the Pinatubo eruption in 1991, typically occur above subduction zones. They form aerosols uh, in the lower stratosphere that typically cool Earth for about a half a degree centigrade for about three years. All the major eruptions in, in written history show that same kind of half a degree for two to four years, depending on the size. And this cooling is global because the aerosols spread globally. Now the climate effect of this cooling is determined by the number of eruptions per century. The lower diagram is showing sea level modeled based on I mean, the temperature of the ocean assuming that there was cooling following Krakatoa of about a half a degree for three years. And what you can see is that the effect is still seen a hundred years later. Uh, and that when you add more and more volcanic eruptions, you increment the ocean cooler and cooler. So if you get about five of these eruptions per century and you do that for tens of thousands of years, that can move the cool the ocean down into an ice age. On the other side, we have aerial extensive flood basaltic eruptions. This is a picture of Bartha Bunga in 2014 in Iceland, the largest of this kind of eruption since 1783. These typically occur in rift zones in Iceland and the African Rift and uh, other places. They deplete ozone warming Earth globally many degrees within years. And the climate effect is determined by the duration and aerial extent. Now this diagram shows the annual average ozone at Arosa, Switzerland in mid-latitudes. And the reds are labeled volcanoes, but what I want you to look at is the two lowest points uh, in the ozone, the ozone has been depleted since 1927. We're following the Pinatubo eruption in 1991, and then following the AF Fiatli Yoko Grimsvatten eruptions in Iceland in 2010. So we observe ozone depletion associated with all volcanic eruptions. But when you form an aerosol, you negate that effect. You reflect enough energy from the sun so that it doesn't cause warming. When the ozone layer is depleted, more ultraviolet B radiation reaches Earth. We observe that. Ultraviolet B burns your skin. It's the hottest radiation from the sun reaching Earth. It has a significant effect on global temperature. Now, looking at a period over the last 60 million years, the green line here is oxygen isotope proxy for temperature and cooling down into the most recent ice age. The black line is ocean crust production increasing downward. The red line is the number, cumulative number of major volcanic eruptions, something I've published a table of in the past. And what we notice is that when we began to have a lot of subjective related uh, volcanoes, uh, we got into the onset of Antarctic glaciation. And this activity went on for a long time all around the world, and we cooled the world significantly. Then when we got the Himalayan mountain building and things were jammed up for a bit, we weren't producing much ocean crust, we weren't having a lot of explosive eruptions, things got warmer. And we had the mid-Miocene climate optimum, which is something related to a much shorter time scale than I'm showing here. Then with a major Pacific plate subduction in the last uh, six to eight million years, we cooled down into the current ice age that we just passed. Now, if we look at the oxygen isotope data over the last 125,000 years since the Eden climatic optimum, this is 57 globally distributed deep sea oxygen isotope records that have been stacked and summed together essentially. Now, oxygen isotopes are looking at the ocean water temperature. So uh, what we're seeing here is it gets cooler and cooler down into the last glacial maximum about 20,000 years ago. The vertical lines are known major explosive volcanoes that I've tabulated. But this 
is what we get kind of integrating, looking at the warming of the ocean. It takes a lot of time to warm the ocean. If we look at the warming of air, we get a whole different picture. This is the same period of time. This is oxygen isotope records observed in Greenland, and it doesn't matter which borehole you're in, you get pretty much the same thing. These are the Dansgaard Esker events observed in Greenland ice. Between 120,000 years and 10,000 years, there were 25 times when there was very rapid warming, typically within a year, less than a decade, followed by cooling over centuries to millennia. So the climate was changing rapidly. We almost came out of the Ice Age each of these times, and then we cooled back into the Ice Age, partly because we didn't warm the ocean. The ocean was still Ice Age temperature, and it cooled us back, partly because explosive eruptions may have helped. And if we compare this to the other curve I showed you, there's a similarity, but the details are quite different. And one of my most important points today is that climate has been changing from cool to warm to cool again within thousands of years throughout the geologic record. And what we see is sudden warming, slow cooling in erratic sequences. Now if we look over just the Holocene, we, this is the same oxygen isotope data from the Greenland ice. And what we see is that every time there was a peak in warming, there was an associated uh, flood basalt occurring at about the same time. Uh, the most recent one we had uh, with the recent warming since 2014 was Barthabunga in Iceland. It covered an area of only 84 square kilometers. But the Elgir eruption in uh, uh, about uh, 900 years ago uh, covered an area of 800 square kilometers. And this was the beginning of the medieval warm period. And what we talk about in the medieval warm period is what you see there under the number 968. The Roman warm period occurred about 200 BC. And it turns out that the most recent basalts in the craters of the moon covered an area of over 700 square kilometers. And they were at that time. We can go back through all these time. It's not just one eruption that causes it. There most likely were several. But I've identified at least one in each case. We do know at the end of the last ice age, what we did observe in great detail, 25,000 years on the left, zero on the right, was that when we warmed out of the ice age, shown in green, there was major, major volcanism. It's the greatest amount of sulfate, volcanic sulfate, observed in the Greenland ice at any time. And that says that warming out of the last ice age had a lot to do with volcanism. We can put our fingers on these volcanoes, they're in Iceland. And it turns out that 12 of the best dated two years of table mountains that are basaltic volcanoes under ice were active during this time, and they ended activity by 9,500 9, years ago. Now, if we go back into the Paleozoic and we look at brachiopod habitat temperatures, the nice thing about oxygen isotopes is we're looking at the temperature at the time this little critter lived. So we've got good time resolution. We may not get an actual date for it that clearly, but what I wanted to get across to you in this diagram is the confusion. You look at the amount of, almost every sample you have is at a different temperature. And we're looking, the, the bottom scale there is zero centigrade on the left and, and 40 centigrade on the right. There's huge changes going on all the time. Now there was some ice ages in here, uh, in blue, and uh, that was integrated over everything. But from time to time, throughout geologic time, everywhere when we look in detail, we're seeing from cool to warm to cool again. It may involve glaciers, it may not. Uh, we're seeing that change occurring in thousands of years. Now, some examples of the big flood basalts are, are well known. The Siberian basalts covered an area of 7 million square kilometers. This was the biggest extinction in history, 96% marine species, 70% terrestrial vertebrates. The Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, when North America and Africa moved apart, 11 million square kilometers, major extinction. The Deccan basalts were just a half a million square kilometers, also major extinction, uh, not worrying about the asteroid. If we look at the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum, this was when Greenland and Europe were moving apart and there was still subaerial volcanism. It increased very, very rapidly. The red on the left is showing the magma productivity and in cubic kilometers per kilometer per million years. And you can see a sudden increase. If we look at this over time, we find that uh, on the left here, I plotted the uh, ages of mass extinctions. On the bottom axis, I plotted the ages of effusive basalts. 
And what we notice is these big uh, fusive basalts that I just talked about are at the end of the Permian, the end of the Triassic, the end of the Cretaceous, the end of the Paleocene. These are major climatic events that change climate and change species, and that's the kind of thing we look at on the geologic time scale. They're typically at the ends. So if we look at the geologic time scale, you'll notice again that the Siberian basalts are the end of the Paleozoic, the Deccan basalts the end of the Mesozoic, and throughout time we can see that many of the time changes that we observe in the geologic record are associated with major flood basalts. An excellent book uh, by Richard Ernst that looks at over 200 of these basalts. Many of them are in the Precambrian and they would have a lot to do with modeling the Precambrian from the talk we heard before the last one. There are only 104 major age changes uh, in the last 540 million years. And I would argue that a large number of them in detail we will find relate to large basaltic volcanism that extrudes <coughs> over land without forming aerosols. So in summary, I'm saying that volcanoes rule climate. The climate change is controlled dominantly by subaerial volcanism, that frequent major explosive eruptions cause incremental cooling, that flood basaltic eruptions cause sudden global warming, that sudden major warming and slow cooling occurs as often as every thousand years in erratic sequences that are clearly not cyclic, and that plate tectonics determines which type of volcanism, so subduction or rift related, is dominant at any time. And we can use these sequences to compare areas, to compare times, much like magnetic anomalies. I describe all this in my book, What Really Causes Global Warming, and you're sitting there saying, okay, volcanoes play this role, but what about CO2? Now this is worth an hour's lecture and I'm just going to give you one point to think about. Greenhouse gases simply do not absorb enough of the broad energy range of frequencies that is known of as heat to be the significant cause of global warming. To heat something, you have to add heat. Now on the lower left, this is a Planck's law uh, determined in 1900 based on observations of radiation. And what Planck showed was a, a body, the temperature of Earth, 288K, would emit the frequencies colored there in green. A light bulb, on the other hand, with a tungsten filament at a temperature of 3300K, lets out all those frequencies shown in yellow. And it lets out a little bit of light, but in addition, uh, it's letting out a lot of heat. And it's that breadth of frequencies that is the heat. And we know an incandescent light bulb gets very hot, hot enough to cook on. So a light bulb emits a broad range of frequencies, which is known as its heat, just to produce a narrow range of visible light. If we use a logarithmic scale now, as is the only difference on the right, the vertical black lines show the frequencies actually absorbed by CO2 in the atmosphere. And these are very limited number of frequencies. In fact, they make up less than 16% of the frequencies that make up the heat radiated by Earth. So greenhouse gases are not absorbing heat. They're absorbing frequencies of thermal energy. And an LED light bulb, we know, emits frequencies of visible light, visible frequencies, and it doesn't emit much heat. And so much like an LED that produces lots of light, the same amount of light as the uh, incandescent light bulb, it ends up not reducing much heat. So again, greenhouse gases simply do not absorb a broad enough range of frequencies, which is known as to be heat, to be the significant cause of global warming. So again, volcanoes seem to be what's driving uh, climate change. Two different kinds of volcanoes. Thank you very much.